This evening, though, I want to talk to you about a little bit of Bible prophecy. I want to look at the role of the Pope and his church in the end times. So as we look into God's prophetic word, the future is glorious for those who have been born again as new creatures in Christ, but it's terrifying for those who are being held captive by religious deception. Their only hope is to abide in God's word and come to a knowledge of the truth so they can be set free from religious deception. I mentioned this morning that Paul wrote to Timothy in chapter 2, verses 24 to 26 in his second epistle. He said, we are to pray for those in opposition that God would grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth so they can escape the snare of the devil that holds them captive to do his will. The only way they can be set free is from the exhortation of Jesus in John chapter 8, verses 31 to 32. A true disciple of mine will abide in my word, then they will know the truth, and the truth will set them free. So we need to contend earnestly for the faith that was once and for all delivered. We need to know that the Roman Catholic Church has a very aggressive agenda to unite all professing Christians under the power and influence of the papacy. So I want to share a slide here that shows you over the last 40 years there has been a decline in discernment in many evangelical churches today. But at the same time, there's been an increase in deception and apostasy. And this shouldn't surprise us because in Matthew 24, when the apostles asked Jesus, what will be the sign of your return? Three different times he mentioned there will be false teachers, false prophets, and false Christ to deceive even the elect if possible. So we know that deception is going to increase as we come to the day of the Lord. And I want you to know as we begin this message that all the messages today have not been about Protestantism versus Catholicism. What we are looking at is false religion through the lens of Scripture because there are apostate Protestant denominations that are just as apostate as the Roman Catholic Church. If you study church history, you know it was in the 4th century that the Roman Catholic Church was formed and they began departing from the faith of the apostles to follow pagan traditions. And that's where the Roman Catholic Church is today. Many pagan traditions have entered into the church, and we will look at some of those. But as far as end times prophecy goes, we read in Revelation 13, all who dwell on the earth will worship him, that is the first beast, everyone whose name has not been written in the Lamb's book of life who has been slain. And then we read in verse 11, the false prophet, the second beast, causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the false Christ. This prophecy reveals that two men will be instrumental in creating a world religion that will worship a counterfeit Christ. This will be the ultimate deception, Satan posing as God, Antichrist masquerading as the true Christ. Instead of a frontal assault on Christianity, the evil one will finish what he has been doing that is, invade the church from the inside and posing as its founder. This should not surprise any of us because the Bible tells us that Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it's not surprising that his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, the words of Paul in 2 Corinthians 11, 14, and 15. So we can be sure Antichrist will appear at the purest angle of light that Satan can produce. Just as many will be deceived by a false Christ, many are now being deceived by the apostate religion of Roman Catholicism. We need to beware of Satan's agenda. You know, he is the master counterfeiter, so it's no surprise then that he has counterfeited the Holy Trinity. In the Holy Trinity, we see the Father who seeks worshipers in spirit and truth, 
John 4, 24. But Satan seeks worship as God, and he will do that through lying signs and wonders. And by the way, I believe one of the lying signs and wonders that he is using even today are apparitions of Mary coming to say that unless you're devoted to my sacred heart, you have no hope of salvation. Mary is said to be coming for all of her children, an angel of light deceiving the world. In the Holy Trinity, you have the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who rules as the King of Kings. In the unholy Trinity, you have Antichrist, who will rule as King, empowered by Satan. In the Holy Trinity, you have the Holy Spirit, who glorifies the Son of God. That is, that's his mission on this earth, to point people to Christ. But the false prophet glorifies Antichrist by causing all in the world to worship him. The Bible tells us that the end times will be marked by a worldwide religious system that will worship a demon-possessed leader called Antichrist, the son of perdition, the man of sin. This will be Satan's final attempt to be exalted as the Most High God and receive the glory he has desired from the beginning. Remember, that's what got him kicked out of heaven. He wanted to be like the Most High God and receive that worship. When you look at Antichrist, the Greek prefix anti means in place of or opposed to. How interesting the Pope believes he is in the place of Christ on earth. He is indeed a self-professed Antichrist. And that's what the Reformers referred to him as. So who is the false prophet of Revelation 13? Well, he is described as a religious leader who resembles a lamb but speaks as a dragon. He has the power to make the earth's inhabitants worship Antichrist, and he kills all who refuse to worship the image. Don't miss this. The false prophet will point the world to Antichrist and will kill everyone who refuses to worship the image. Has this ever happened before? Let me take you back to the Reformation. Here we see death to those who refuse to worship the image. The Pope ordered many reformers burned to death because they denied the very body and blood of Jesus Christ was present in the Eucharist. Quote from Bishop J.C. Ryle. Ryle went on to say that union with Rome would be an insult to our martyred reformers. The Roman Catholic Church has a horrendous history of torturing and murdering anyone who would not bow their knee to the Pope. In fact, during the Inquisition, they killed millions of Christians during the St. Bartholomew Day Massacre in the streets of Paris. An estimated 100,000 French Huguenots were slaughtered in France. And do you know what they received? Those who murdered the French Huguenots, they received a plenary indulgence by the Pope. The Vatican has since changed its strategy by, for world dominion. Seduction rather than force is now their new strategy, and we're going to look at their strategy this evening. The papacy exalts itself above God and his word. The papacy steals titles from God. He is referred to as Holy Father, a title reserved to the one and only Holy Father. It's mentioned in the Lord's high priestly prayer in John 17. He's also declared to be the head of the church, and yet he never went to die for the church, stealing that title from the Lord Jesus He's also referred to as the vicar of Christ. And when Jesus said, I must depart, but I will send a helper in my place, he was not referring to the papacy, but to the Holy Spirit. The papacy robs Christ of his power over souls. He also usurps God's infallibility, daring to say that whenever he teaches from the chair of Peter, he cannot err in matters of faith and morals and he condemns all who believe God's gospel with an anathema. This is the papacy. In paragraph 937 of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, the Pope is said to have supreme, full, immediate, and universal power in the care of souls. He is said to exercise this power unhindered. Any pope who touts his own authority, boasts of his own holiness, 
and steals the titles given to God alone, defies imagination. Yet so many are deluded by this man. I hope you all agree the most wicked thing any man could ever do is to deceive people about life's most critical issue. And this is what this Pope does. And I know this information may offend some people, but I can only imagine the offense before God of a man who dares to exalt himself above God himself. The papacy also receives worship due only to God. You know, Peter is a a man most Catholics believe was the first pope, and yet when people were bowing down to worship him, you know what he said? Get up and worship God alone. But not so about the popes today. They receive the worship due only to God. Listen to Martin Luther. The Pope is the very Antichrist who exalted himself above and opposed himself against Christ because he will not permit Christians to be saved without his power, to lie, to kill, and destroy body and soul eternally. That is where his papal government really consists. And you know Martin Luther knew this Pope very well. Martin Luther was a very devout Roman Catholic priest until he opened the Bible and he was confronted with the truth of God's Word. The papacy stands in direct opposition to the Lord Jesus Christ and his work, which is the gospel, and his word, which is the scriptures. This is why the reformers called the papacy antichrist as one who claims to represent Christ but actually opposes him. And then you have Charles Spurgeon. He said, and I quote, Popery is as much the masterpiece of Satan as the gospel is the masterpiece of God. It robs Christ of his glory because it puts sacramental efficacy in the place of his atonement and lifts a piece of bread into the place of the Savior. Where are the Charles Spurgeons of today? Why are evangelical leaders embracing and applauding the Pope of Rome instead of warning their congregation? The papacy is viewed by Catholics as the spiritual bridge builder between God and man, the visible head and the high priest of the church. Pope Francis is the high priest of Catholicism, which is why he wears the title Pontificus Maximus, which means the highest priest. His Twitter handle is at Pontificus. So is the Holy Father really the Holy Father, or is he a pawn of Satan? Pope Francis has been one of the most controversial popes in the history of the Roman Catholic Church. He not only opposes God's Word, but he also opposes historic Roman Catholicism. His deceptive lies are leading millions of people down the wide road to destruction. And the Bible defines him this way. Such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And that's what the father of lies does. He uses his false apostles to deceive the world. Like a deadly undetected cancer, these lies can spread quickly unless they are exposed and refuted by the word of God. If we truly love people, we must tell them the truth so they can be aware of Satan's strategy to deceive the world. So when we look at the last day's church, we see that the church will have a form of godliness but deny its power. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5. We also see the way of, church, the way of truth will be maligned and false teachers will revel in their deception. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 2 and 13. Here I think we get an idea of just how widespread the deception is going to be because when Jesus asked the question, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? That's how compromised the gospel has become today. Many people profess to be Christians, but they believe they compromise gospel. Many in the church are false converts because they have never been called to repent and believe the gospel as it is gloriously revealed in Scripture. So what will be the role of the Roman Catholic Church in the last days? 
Well, by now you must know that it has a well-defined strategy to unite the world under the power and influence of the Pope. The Vatican boasts of being the headquarters of God's kingdom on earth. It has great wealth, great power, and worldly influence. And you know that much of its wealth came from selling indulgences, the forgiveness of sin in the form of indulgences. That was one of the sparks of the Reformation. <clears throat> Traditional Catholicism has always strived for complete religious control of the entire planet. And please understand, that is the goal of every religion in the world. Every religion in the world attempts to control its people by a works righteousness salvation. It is only biblical Christianity that dares to say that you are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, because Jesus Christ is the all-sufficient Savior. You need to know about the Jesuit agenda. Pope Francis is the first Jesuit pope, and the Jesuits were formed in the 5th, 16th century at the Counter-Reformation. And since its beginning, the Jesuits have been establishing a kingdom for their pope. During the Inquisition, they ordered countless millions murdered and are now calling separated brethren back home to Rome. We need to understand the Jesuit agenda if we are to understand the agenda of the Roman Catholic Church. In one sense, it's the secret police of the papacy. Their goal in the 16th century was to eliminate all opposition to the Roman Catholic Church. And their strategy has been very widespread today. They're building schools and hospitals, and through these schools, they are able to teach Roman Catholic propaganda to all those who come and it really grieves me when I hear of evangelicals sending their children to Roman Catholic schools because they don't want to use the public school system. They fail to realize that while their children are in Roman Catholic schools, they're going to be indoctrinated with Roman Catholic theology. So we see that the Eucharist is a non-negotiable sign of unity. Vatican Council II in 1965 said this, and I quote, all Christians will be gathered together in a common celebration of the Eucharist into the unity of the one and only church. This unity subsists in the Catholic Church as something she can never lose. This is the calling card of the Roman Catholic Church to bring all separated brethren back home to Rome for the fullness of salvation. As I go and I talk to priests and share the gospel with them, oftentimes they're, they're so excited to see me because their goal is to bring me back home to Rome. And they will sit down and they will tell me, until I come back to Rome for the Eucharist, I do not have the fullness of salvation. And my response is, in Christ, I have the complete forgiveness of sin, and according to your catechism, you don't. In Christ, I have the assurance of eternal life with him in heaven, and according to cate your catechism, you don't. You need to leave your religion and come to the true Christ, then you too can have the fullness of salvation. But please be aware, this is the drawing card to bring Protestants back home to Rome. I shared this this morning, but I need to share it again this evening. This is what every Roman Catholic priest believes he has the power to do. When the priest announces the words of consecration, he reaches up into the heavens and brings Christ down from his throne and places him upon our altar to be offered up again as the victim for the sins of man. It is a power greater than that of saints and angels. The priest speaks, and lo, Christ the eternal and omnipotent God bows his head in humble obedience to the priest's command. This grieves me when I have to read this. But yet this has the official imprimatur of the Roman Catholic religion. This is what they believe every priest has the power to do. As preposterous and unthinkable as this may sound, the Catholic priest is said to have the power to call Almighty God down from heaven and to continue on an altar what he finished on the cross. 
over 200,000 times every day on Catholic altars throughout the world, priests believe they represent Jesus as a sacrificial victim for sins. Our Lord endured excruciating pain and torture for sinners at once and for all time. He was pierced through for our transgressions and was crushed for our iniquities, as we read in Isaiah 53, 5. It is unconscionable that Catholics would want to continue his suffering on their altars every day. Well, let's look at the Vatican's attempt to bring all Christians back home to Rome under the Pope. Vatican Council II launched the ecumenical movement. Then you had evangelicals and Catholics together. These were unity accords signed by Chuck Colson and Roman Catholic priest Richard John Newhouse, daring to say that we share a common faith in the gospel. And in the, you see a picture here of Catholics and Lutherans together signing a joint declaration on justification. If you were here this morning, you see how diametrically opposed the Roman Catholic position on justification is from the Bible. Justification was the gates that opened the gates of heaven, was the, the very principle of the gospel that opened the gates of heaven. Martin Luther said if you get justification wrong, you get the gospel wrong. And yet now we have Lutherans signing an accord saying we agree with Catholics. And then in 2002, you had Catholics and evangelicals in conversation at Wheaton College. And more recently, the Manhattan Declaration in 2009 were highly visible, highly influential evangelicals have signed a unity accord daring to say that we share a common faith with Catholics. This is very disturbing because some of our once most respected evangelical leaders are signing these accords. Right now, 640,000 evangelicals have signed the Manhattan Declaration. Well, John MacArthur has given a very clarion voice renouncing unity accords. He said, in the long war on truth, the most formidable, relentless, and deceptive enemy has been Roman Catholicism. It is an apostate, corrupt, heretical, false Christianity. It is a front for the kingdom of Satan. Where are the John MacArthur's speaking out today? Instead, we have people signing unity accords with Roman Catholics. Well, the Bible speaks of two kinds of unity. There is a biblical unity, and that's the sovereign work of the Holy Spirit. It's not a work of man. It demonstrates a common faith in the gospel because the only way to have unity, according to the Bible, is to be baptized by one spirit into one body. In John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, we see that. It's not a work of man. It's a work of God alone. But yet then there's the religious unity, which is a work of Satan, who uses man's prideful ambitions and biblical ignorance to unite the world. In some sense, you see Satan rebuilding the religious tower of Babel today. We need to be aware of that. We need to be aware of the strategy. The catalyst is the Vatican, the Roman Catholic Church. Pope Francis says everyone is a child of God. This is a direct quote. He said, despite the differing beliefs, everyone is a child of the same God. Many think differently or seek God in different ways, but there is only one certainty. We are all children of God. Many who do not know the Bible are being deceived by this Pope's pronouncement that they can seek God in different ways. The Pope's assertion directly opposes God's word. No one seeks for God, no, not one. The Bible tells us something directly opposite of what the Pope stated. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 10, we read, It is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. And then we see the Lord Jesus Christ confronting the apostate Jews in John chapter 8. To them he said, you are of your father the devil, 
and your will is to do your Father's desires. When the apostate Jewish leaders refused to believe the truth of God's word, Jesus said their father was the devil. Everyone is a child of the devil until they exchange their religion for a relationship with the one true God through Jesus Christ. According to God's word, only those who receive Jesus by believing in his name become children of God. And we see that in John chapter 1, verses 12 to 13. Like Satan... The Pope does not stand for truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and deceives the world. Did you know that the Pope canonized an agnostic unbeliever, Mother Teresa? At the end of her life, Mother Teresa doubted the very existence of God She doubted the existence of heaven. In her private letters, she wrote, Lord, my God, you have thrown me away as unwanted and unloved. I call, I cling, I want. There is no one to answer. No, no, not one. I have no faith. She was a self-professed agnostic, but yet she is considered a saint in the Roman Catholic Church. Pope Francis said, the Lord has redeemed us all, all of us with the blood of Christ, all of us, not just Catholics, everyone, even the atheist. Well, here you see the Pope is a universalist and has said even that there is no hell. He said that if you're an atheist, you will get to heaven as long as you are sincere. And then we have Pope Francis signing a unity accord with Muslims. The Pope and the Grand Inman of Al-Azhar have signed a historic declaration calling for peace between nations, religions, and races. Together they stood hand in hand in a symbol of interfaith brotherhood. The Grand Inman, considered to be the most important man in Sunni Islam, greeted Pope Francis And together they are working to unite Islam into part of the new world religion. According to paragraph 841 of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, Muslims are part of God's salvation. This is really amazing because you and I, who believe in the sufficiency of our Lord Jesus Christ, that we are saved by grace and justified by faith alone. We are condemned by the Roman Catholic religion over 100 times with their anathemas. But Muslims who deny that Jesus went to the cross, Muslims who deny that Jesus is God, are said to be part of God's plan of salvation. Here you see a worship center for three monotheistic religions that is soon to be opened in Saudi Arabia. It is called the Abrahamic Family House. It will be a communal place of worship with a synagogue, a church, and a mosque in a single complex. Scheduled to open later this year, Pope Francis and the Grand Inman initiated the project in Abu Dhabi, in 2019. More than ever, we are seeing a convergence of major world religions as they seek common bonds of unity. On our website, I have an article that shows that Roman Catholicism has more in common with Islam than it does with biblical Christianity. And I share with you 10 common bonds. One of them we are seeing even today. Islam esteems Mary as the most revered woman who has ever lived. She is mentioned more in the Quran than she is in the Bible. In fact, she is the only woman mentioned in the Quran. And Muslims today are flocking to the apparition site in Fatima, a city named after Muhammad's first daughter. Muslims are going there to get a message from Mary. I was interviewed by the History Channel years ago. And I said something that they used in the opening segment of the telecast. I said it is amazing to me that people will spend thousands of dollars and travel thousands of miles to get a message from an apparition of Mary when they can open their Bible right where they are and get a message directly from God. It truly is amazing. 
Did you know that Pope Francis also believes that gays will be saved? He says God's mercy has no limits if you go to him with a sincere and contrite heart. The issue for those who do not believe in God is to obey their conscience. And you see here a picture of Pope Francis on the gay magazine, The Advocate. He was named Person of the Year. The gay community really loves Pope Francis. The Pope knows that if he appears to be humble and tolerant, homosexuals and atheists will be loved by, he will be loved by more people. I think it would be good for the Pope to hear the words of Christ. Woe to you when all people speak well of you. Luke chapter 6, verse 26. And did you know the Pope praised an abortionist? He praised Italy's leading proponent of abortion, Emma Bonio, as one of the nation's forgotten greats. Bonino worked with an abortion clinic that boasted of over 10,000 abortions. Pro-life leaders in Italy expressed disbelief in the Pope praising her. Where's the outrage from Roman Catholics? When are Catholics going to say enough is enough? How many more lies and ungodly statements are they willing to tolerate from this false prophet? He is the most influential, most powerful false prophet in the world today. He not only controls 1.3 billion Roman Catholics, but you can see many evangelical leaders are also following after him. He also seeks to ban the death penalty. Pope Francis said all Christians and men of goodwill are called on to work for the abolition of the death penalty. Once again, the Pope shows his unwillingness to submit to the Bible's authority. Even before the Mosaic law was given, God established and ordered capital punishment upon any man who took another man's life unlawfully. The Pope also demands global authority. By the way, he is not only a religious leader, he's also a political leader. He's the head of state at the Vatican, which is a sovereign nation. That's why you have ambassadors from all the nations of the world coming to pay homage to him. Pope Francis is now trying to convince the world that our only hope for peace, prosperity, and planetary salvation is for nations to surrender their sovereignty to a global government. During a recent speech, Pope Francis advocated a policy of decreased national sovereignty and increased global unity, claiming that planetary problems are exacerbated by an excessive demand for sovereignty on the part of states. Truly amazing the influence this man has. At the turn of the century, he also pointed people to a wooden door he opened the holy door in St. Peter's Basilica to offer plenary indulgence for the remission of punishment for sins. And those who pass through the door will receive this indulgence. Many people traveled to the Vatican to go through these wooden doors to receive a plenary indulgence. The Pope needs to know that the Lord Jesus is the only door of salvation. Jesus said, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The Lord Jesus Christ is man's only hope of salvation. Amen. The eternal sin debt was canceled when the perfect high priest offered himself the perfect sacrifice to a perfect God who demands perfection. And then Jesus cried out, To tell us, die, it is finished. There are no more offerings for sin because by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Hebrews 10 14. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the fields are white for harvest. This is a very opportune time to sit down with an open Bible with your Roman Catholic family and loved ones and neighbors because they don't know who to trust. Roman Catholics don't know what to do with Pope Francis. They know he doesn't even represent historic Roman Catholicism. 
So his bizarre teachings have left many unsure about who they can trust. They are seeking an authority they can trust. Let's take advantage of the opportunity and point them to Christ and his word. It was Jesus who said, I am the truth. Jesus said, my word is truth. Jesus said, I came to testify to the truth. Jesus said, everybody on the side of the truth listens to me. If anyone is searching for the truth, why would they look anywhere other than Christ and his word? You and I are truth bearers. We need to point people to the only infallible, authoritative source for truth, Christ and his word. Rome's strategy for Christian unity is to redefine evangelical terms to make them ambiguous, vague, and acceptable to all. They're trying to beguile and confuse Protestants with Catholic mystics and contemplative spirituality. They're also urging you and I, separated brethren, to come home to Holy Mother of the Church for the fullness of salvation. Prior to Vatican Council II in 1965, you and I were labeled as heretics. But now, they realize they can't woo us back home to Rome by calling us names, so now we're separated brethren who do not have the fullness of salvation. Another strategy is to seduce highly visible evangelicals to promote Catholicism as a valid expression of Christianity. Can I share with you just how successful they have been? I'm going to give you some quotes. Rick Warren calls Pope Francis our Pope. He said, I really do feel that these people, Roman Catholics, are brothers and sisters in God's family. I'm looking to build bridges with the Catholic Church. His purpose-driven life was also printed and reprinted to give to the Roman Catholic people. So they, too, had his false gospel in the purpose-driven life. And then you have Louis Palau. He said Pope Francis is a very Bible-centered and Jesus Christ-centered man. He's really centered on the pure gospel. He is a friend of evangelicals. See, Louis Palau is from Argentina, which is where Pope Francis was before he became pope. He was a cardinal there. Louis Perlau and I used to do conferences together. He would take our Spanish tracts down to South America to give to Roman Catholics because they rec he recognized that they were a huge mission field. But now that his buddy has become Pope, all of a sudden, Pope Francis is a Jesus Christ-centered man. You heard the quotes I just gave. Do you think Louis Palau is correct? How about Robert Jeffers of First Baptist Church, Dallas, Texas, when Pope Benedict resigned on a TV program, he said this, the Pope was a wonderful, dedicated Christian man, and we celebrate the ministry he has had. Now again, I know Robert Jeffers, we've done conferences together. When I heard this on the TV broadcast, I immediately emailed him. And I said, Robert, how can you call Pope Benedict a wonderful, dedicated Christian man and celebrate the ministry he's had when he blocked the gates of heaven to those who wanted to enter with a false and fatal gospel? Robert wrote back and said, Mike, whenever I'm on public TV, I cannot bash Catholics. And I wrote back and I said, that wasn't my question. You could have done one of three things. You could have told the truth, which you chose not to do. You could have remained neutral, which you chose not to do, or you could have deceived your audience by calling a false prophet a wonderful, dedicated Christian man. And this one here is really alarming. Al Mohler said Pope Benedict was one of the most brilliant theological minds of our times. Now please understand, Pope Benedict, before he became Pope, he was Cardinal Ratzinger. He was the author of the Catechism of the Catholic Church that is the authority for Roman Catholicism today. The Catechism of the Catholic Church teaches a gospel that is under divine anathema. How can Al Mohler call this man one of the most brilliant theological minds of our times, one who 
distorted the gospel and is under divine condemnation. Was the Reformation a mistake? There are evangelical leaders that believe it was. Here is a graduate of Dallas Theological Seminary who pastored a church in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, Irving Bible Church. When John Paul II died, he published in the church magazine a picture of John Paul and Mother Teresa. In the article next to the picture, he said this, the rift that occurred between Catholics and Protestants 500 years ago is theological pettiness. In other words, Andy McQuitty is saying that the Reformers died for theological pettiness. He went on to say, we'll have plenty of time in heaven to figure out who was right about purgatory and Mary. John Paul was a man of God whom all Christians should admire, thank, and emulate. When I heard about this, I immediately called up the church and asked if I could come in and set the record straight to teach them what the Roman Catholic Church really taught but they were unwilling to take in someone who stood on the truth of God's Word. So as a result, over 3,000 people at Irving Bible Church believe that Roman Catholics are their brothers and sisters in Christ. This was a recent survey by Lifeway Research. Almost two-thirds of 1,000 Protestant pastors that were surveyed said that Pope Francis is their brother in Christ. Two-thirds of evangelical Protestant pastors believe Pope Francis is their brother in Christ. More than one-third say they value the Pope's view on theology and that he has improved their view of the Catholic Church. These are responses from the survey. Can you see the compromise within the evangelical church? Many are believing the Reformation was a mistake. It simply divided the church. More than ever, we need to contend for the exclusivity and the purity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. What hope does the next generation have if we don't contend earnestly for the faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints? Those who promote unity with false teachers without challenging their errors, leave their own convictions and beliefs open to question. We may all be held accountable for the souls who are misled by our unwillingness to contend earnestly for the faith. Let us all defend the glory and honor of our Savior by exposing the evil deeds of darkness with the light of God's word. What's at stake if we don't contend for the faith? You know, when the the close of the first century, the faith that Jude exhorts us to contend for was signed, sealed, and delivered. Nothing can be added to it. When you look at Roman Catholic history, they have added ungodly traditions down through the last 1,600 years. More than ever, we need to contend against those unbiblical traditions and point people to the faith of the apostles There are some Protestants that are leaving their churches to join the Roman Catholic religion today. They never, ever leave because of the Bible. We've been doing this ministry for 31 years. The reason Protestants leave is because they have been convinced that the Catholic Church is the one true church founded by Christ, and they read the early church fathers. Now, if you've read any of the early church fathers, you will find they are on both sides of every issue. You have those that stand for the truth once and for all, delivered to the saints, and then you have the apostates that had already begun departing from the faith. And so we need to build our theology on the inspired, inerrant, infallible Word of God. We should not listen to early church fathers. In the same way, we don't want to point Roman Catholics to the Reformers. All they did was uncover what had been buried for 1,600 years. We need to point them to the Word of God. That's where they need to build their theology. There's a popular bumper sticker that you may have seen. If you know Jesus, you will know peace. And when there is no Jesus, there is no peace. I was inspired to come up with a corollary When you know doctrine, 
you're going to know division. And when there is no doctrine, there is no division. And that's what the ecumenical people are trying to do, suppress doctrinal truth so we can all come together and worship whatever Christ you want to worship. Divine division and truth is infinitely better than satanic unity and error. Please remember, truth is the only thing I know that both unites and divides. Those who have believed the truth are born again of the Spirit. We have unity in the body of Christ. But those who are opposed to the truth stand divided. Jesus said, I came to divide father against son, mother against daughter. And that's what the truth does. It divides the believing world from the unbelieving world. We must have doctrine. So I hope you can see from what you have heard this evening that Christians and Catholics can never be united. We are divided on the essentials of the gospel. We're divided on how one is born again. Rome says it's the efficacious waters of baptism. The Bible says it's the sovereign work of the Holy Spirit. We're divided on how one is justified. Rome says faith plus works. The Bible says faith alone. We're divided on how one is purified of sin. Rome says the fire is of purgatory. The Bible says the precious blood of Jesus. We're divided on who mediates between God and man. Rome has many different mediators, even another sinless mediator called Mary. The Bible says there's only one. God's perfect man and man's perfect God. We're divided on the sufficiency and the necessity of our Lord Jesus Christ. There cannot be any unity with Roman Catholics. We're divided on the path to paradise. And we need to remember the words of the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 6, verses 14 to 17. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers, for what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? What fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, the Lord God Almighty. Note the five vivid contrasts. Righteousness with lawlessness, light with darkness, Christ with Belial, a believer with an unbeliever, the temple of God with idols. Do not be unequally yoked. And yet that's what these unity accords between Catholics and evangelicals have attempted to do, to unite Roman Catholics with Christians. Does God need us to unite with unbelievers to accomplish his purposes to fight the social and moral wars? Absolutely not. He can do it with dedicated Christian people willing to stand up for the truth. Well, there are two paths to eternity. The Lord Jesus said we need to enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. The gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. The context here. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. There are so many warnings throughout the New Testament, warning of false teachers who will deceive and mislead and destroy the lives of people. They are all pawns of the devil. We need to be on the alert. I shared this this morning, these two paths to eternity, and I know some of you weren't here, but this is available in our Red Gospel track. Roman Catholics believe that it's water baptism that puts them on the road to heaven. When they commit these lesser sins, called venial sins, they lose some of their right standing before God. When they commit a mortal sin, they're destined for hell again, and it's only by receiving the sacraments and doing good works they can produce enough merit to qualify for heaven again. Roman Catholics go through this cycle hundreds of times, never knowing where they stand before a holy and righteous judge in heaven. At the end of a Catholic's life, if he never hears the gospel, or if he hears it and rejects it, he will one day stand before the Lord Jesus at the great white throne and hear the most terrifying words anyone can ever hear when Jesus says, depart from me, I never knew you, and they're cast into the eternal lake of fire. What a contrast with the biblical path. 
We're born destined for hell, but it's not water baptism, it's faith in Christ. At that very moment, we are justified. We begin the process of sanctification with the promise in Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, we put to death the evil deeds of the flesh and we conform our lives to the life of Christ. And then at the end of a believer's life, either at the rapture of the church or when they go into the presence of our Lord, Hopefully there we will hear the words, well done, my good and faithful servant, and then we'll sing his praises throughout all eternity. Amen? Amen. Two different paths, the narrow way and the broad way. We need to point Roman Catholics to the narrow way. As I close, let me ask you a few questions to ponder. How many people in your circle of influence even know that you're a Christian? Have you ever shared the gospel with people in your workplace, in your neighborhood? Do they know that you are a born-again Christian? How many of you engaged in a spiritual conversation? How are you doing with the Lord's last command? Is it your great commission or is it your great omission? Questions to ponder for all of us. And I just want you to know just how excited my wife Jane and I have been to be in your presence because we have seen a heart of love and compassion for the lost. There are times when we will bring gospel tracts with us as we go and preach and teach and equip the body of Christ, and we bring most of the gospel tracts home. But this church has completely wiped out our gospel tracts. So I know that you have a real desire to share the gospel, and to sow the seed of God's word. So what must we do with a message like this? Well, some of you might be AWOL, absent without leave. You need to re-enlist in the Lord's army to fight the good fight of faith. I hope you can see that there is a war that's going on right now, and ultimately this war is a battle between God's truth and Satan's lies, and it's a battle for the souls of men. It looks like we're losing the battle because most of the world is perishing. But again, the Lord Jesus said very few find the narrow gate, and I believe part of the problem is very few of us are pointing them to the narrow gate. We need to contend against everyone who distorts or compromises the gospel. You know, when I gave you the quotes of some of our leading evangelicals, that's all I did was give you the quotes If you have an issue with them, you need to take it up with them. And I have contacted them. I have asked them to reconsider and to change your position, but so far been unsuccessful. We need to never let a lie of the devil go unabated. Whenever you're in a conversation with people and you hear them spew a lie of the devil, you need to stand up for the glory and honor of our great God and Savior. Stand up for the truth. Stand up for the gospel. If they have a right to spew a lie, you have a greater right to stand up for the truth. Evangelize those who are deceived and perishing. The mission field is great. Out these doors represents a huge mission field. As you meet people throughout the day, just engage them with spiritual conversations So often people tell me, I just don't know how to get a conversation directed to spiritual things. It's very easy. Ask them if they're a Christian. 86% of Americans say they are. You've got a common ground to start with. Where do you go to church? How does your church teach you have any hope of going to heaven? It's that easy. When you don't hear the right answer according to the Bible, share the truth with them. Because of this ecumenical movement, I put together a book called Contending for the Gospel. We need to contend for the gospel, for the glory of Christ, and the sanctity of his church. It's time for all Christians to to defend the purity and the exclusivity of the gospel. And don't forget our website, proclaimingthegospel.org. We have a free newsletter that goes out via email once a month on the first of every month. And if you sign up while you're here, 
My wife, Jane, will send you out a copy of the newsletter that went out this morning. So I want to thank the elders of this church for the invitation to come and share with you a great burden that the Lord has placed on my heart. I have a great compassion, a great love for Roman Catholics who are where I was for most of my life, believing I belong to the one true church, but woefully deceived about the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So thank you for the opportunity to equip you and to encourage you. Come on up, Pastor, and you can close our time in prayer. And I'll be at the resource table. If any of you have questions, I would love to be able to answer any of them for you. Thank you, Mike, for being one of my teachers that you've used greatly in my life. Thank you. Well, this just tells me that Mike needs to come back every Sunday night because this is how we feel Sunday night service here, obviously. But thank you for coming. If any of you want to help with some of our barbecue expenses and, and some of the expenses of bringing Mike out here, uh, we just have the little box in the back. Uh, no pressure at all. And uh, we just invite you. Remember, it's not about uh, inviting you to come to church. It's inviting you to come to Jesus Christ. So I hope that you'll go with that message. Let me close this in prayer. Father, I thank you for every single soul that's here tonight. I believe that you, Lord, answered our prayers to move people to come, to listen. And I pray, Lord, now by your Holy Spirit, you would move them to respond. Lord, to cry out to you just like Jim did, even if it's on I-70 out in the middle of Kansas. Whenever you bring them to that point of repentance and faith, that you would, they would cry out to you that you are Lord. They would ask you to be the Lord of their life. And then, Lord, help Christians here in this room be faithful in the Great Commission. Help them to find a good biblical church that will help them to learn the word and live the word. And we seek your power to help us to do that. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. At the sun.